apologies for the late start. Um, welcome to uh, the latest instalment of the Histories of Capitalism and Race in the Middle East and Indian Ocean uh, seminar. Um, this week, um, we're, I'm, I'm really thrilled that uh, Katayun Shafi is here uh, to speak about her book, uh, Machineries of Oil, uh, which was published in 2018. Um, uh, just before I bring, uh, introduce Kato Yun, um, um, I, I'd also like to say that, uh, well, firstly, thank you to my fellow conveners of this series, uh, Hengar Meir Ziai and uh, Sarah Al Kazaz, uh, also to our brilliant um, assistants Ada Ferrarasi and uh, Joao Moreira da Silva. Um, also, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, our two student respondents. This week, um, so we have uh, Noor Al Sabag, uh, who's doing a PhD uh, in history here at SOAS, uh, and also uh, Anum Imran, who's doing an MA in uh, religion and global politics. Okay, so I'll uh, I'll introduce Kato Yoon now. So Kato Yoon is an assistant uh, associate professor of modern Middle East history at the Islamic world uh, and the Islamic world in the history department at the University of Warwick. She is the author of Machineries of Oil, an Infrastructural History of BP in Iran, which brings together histories of the Middle East with interdisciplinary thinking in science and technology studies uh, to reconfigure the politics of the Middle East through a study of the British-controlled oil industry in Iran. Uh, she is currently working on her second book pro project, which um, maybe we could speak a bit about today, uh, called Governing Democratic Futures, Risky Measures Along an Iranian Waterway, uh, 1920 to 79, which explores the role of neoclassical economics in the politics of international water resource development in Iran, while continuing to consider the centrality of technologies of energy development in shaping political possibilities in the 20th century. So, um, Katayun will speak for about uh, 25 minutes, uh, and then um, I will bring in our student respondents. Uh, and then uh, I'll let you respond to, to them before bringing, uh, opening it to, to the floor. So, uh, Katayun, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Martin Bitlari, um, and the SOAS Histories of Capitalism and Race Seminar Series for inviting me um, to share my work with you. Um, I look forward to receiving your comments and questions um, at the end. So most of you are probably aware of the importance of oil um, to the history of the modern Middle East, but we know um, surprisingly little about how the social and technical properties of oil have shaped that history. Conventional ways of writing social and political history treat technical problems of producing processing and selling oil as processes that are external to the social world. So oil is said to have an impact on society as simply a natural resource that affects political systems, social and economic orders, and state formation from the outside, while blocking the possibility for democratic forms um, of politics. So my book, Machineries of uh, Machineries of Oil and Infrastructural History of BP in Iran, as uh, Mateen said, draws on some interdisciplinary thinking from a field called Science and Technology Studies um, to offer an alternative account of this history um, by, as I say, following the oil itself um, and mapping the socio-technical arrangements through which it gets produced, transported, and sold from a small corner of southwest Iran in the first half of the 20th century. Um, so in order to put the book together, I coll collected a significant amount of archival material from um, the BP archive, which is based at the same place I'm based, University of Warwick um, in Coventry, as well as from various government and oil company archives in Iran and in the US. Just want to move sure, to the next. So. I press yeah. Okay. Um, sorry. So you can go. Shall I? Which should I go? Okay. 
that's just a cover of the book. Um, so, uh, you know, I did that research at the archive and uh, in, in Coventry at the BP archive and also in the US and Iran. Um, but the former headquarters um, of the International Oil Corporation that we all know today as BP um, are located at the historic Britannic House um, in this image, which is at Finsbury Circus in London. Um, the building has a notable history, um, having been des designed by a celebrated British imperial architect, Sir Edwin Landseer Lutyens, in the 1920s. And so when I um, visited the building, I, I discovered that there was much more detail um, to, to, to see, um, that being the image of a Persian scarf dancer, as it's um, titled, um, of a woman performing a traditional Persian dance by Frances Derwent Wood. So to me, um, the sculpture, along with the building itself, announces the British imperial origins of the company um, in Iran and its former identity as the Anglo-Persian or Anglo-Iranian oil company. So in the book, I talk about how the construction of the headquarters coincided with um, the rise of these transnational oil corporations, so between the two world wars, um, as a new kind of political actor. The building of the world oil industry, um, as we know, served as the occasion for one of the largest projects of technical and economic development in the latter half of the 19th and early 20th centuries. So along with railroads, dams, electricity, and communication networks, there was a vast global network of oil wells, pipelines, refineries, and transoceanic shipping um, that resulted from this enterprise. Now, one way that social scientists like to explain the development of this energy system is to think of oil, um, as I mentioned before, as a natural resource, um, therefore reducing oil to its economic properties as a rent, um, or a, a kind of revenue, while ignoring the material properties of the oil infrastructure, so all that constitutes um, the, the operations, um, in shaping the state and producing the oil company itself. So my work attempt, attempts to avoid this account of an inside and an outside to oil operations by following the transformation of the oil through the machinery of oil operations, um, from the initial development of the Anglo-Iranian oil industry in the first um, decade of the 20th century to the company's dramatic departure and subsequent return as um, British Petroleum during Iran's oil nationalization crisis over 50 years later. So this is just a map showing you um, within that small red square where um, the, the oil operations or the oil regions um, in southwest Iran were located along the Persian Gulf. Um, the region forms part of the Zagros Basin of southwest Iran um, and is inhabited by Farsi and Arabic speaking um, nomadic and settled populations. This is um, just an image of the subsoil. It comes from the BP company history where, um, which, and it, it sort of tells us that there are these limey shale formations that characterize um, the subsoil that stretches across the border into Iraq and other Persian Gulf areas. So these carbon-rich source rocks are the product of rising sea levels, low oxygen, and nu nutrient-rich environments, um, which over hundreds of millions of years accumulated specifically in the folds, um, which are called anticlines, so whale-shaped, uh, whale-back-shaped folds, um, which trapped enormous amounts of oil and gas in the region. This is just showing you the proliferation of all the oil and gas fields that exist today um, in Iran and, and across the border uh, and within in the, in the Persian Gulf. But when British investors led by William Knox Darcy um, signed the first oil concession agreement with the Iranian government in 1901, they knew very little um, about oil development. It's true that there were British financiers who had interests in oil companies um, formed much earlier in the 1880s and 1890s, such as the Burma Oil Company, 
uh, Royal Dutch and the Shell groups. There were also American oil companies such as John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil, which had been around since the 1870s. Um, so these companies uh, had built their successes on the di distribution and sale of kerosene um, for lighting and heating, which was oil's main marketable use in the early years. However, um, the growing popularity of the gasoline-powered combustion engine uh, marked this um, gradual displacement of coal as the main source of power um, uh, by oil um, for the industrial world. Uh, we also, in this period, see the rise of rival imperial navies transitioning to oil. Um, between 1910 and 1916, oil went from supplying only 5% of world commercial energy supplies to over 50%. Um, so there is this global energy shift um, occurring. And at that time, in 1908, William Knox Darcy's team of drillers first extracted oil um, from southwest Iran. And it was with commercial backing by the British Admiralty that the new oil company, Anglo-Persian, um, later Anglo-Iranian oil company, um, produced fuel oil for export, uh, export abroad by the First World War. So in the following two decades, this new company um, developed a lot of research and development around oil to, to learn about its properties. They knew very little about the properties of the oil. Um, in Khuzestan province. Um, they recruited consulting geologists and engineers with previous experience in Southeast Asia, the US, and Mexico. And so it was the site you know, of the first uh, foreign-controlled oil industry in the region. Um, there was some production in Baku as well, but um, this was the, the big site. And over the span of five decades, all kinds of technologies um, of oil development and marketing would be get worked out, which is what the book tracks, as well as the political consequences for sovereignty, government, um, and revolutionary movements, which remain relevant today. Um, in terms of the historiography or what sorts of histories we have, they um, tend to be dominated um, by Daniel Jurgen's well-known work, The Prize, which is this comprehensive um, history of oil that typifies the standard history as the story of these corporate titans whose actions determine uh, political transformation. But um, at the, in, the, in the period when I was writing the book, there was no um, history of oil that discussed the ways in which the technical and social aspects of the industry interacted to shape the state and political possibilities for democracy. So again, um, my, my work is drawing on um, other kinds of thinking in science and technology studies to take seriously that technical development um, of oil in the Middle East, um, which didn't just encounter society and the economy as pre-existing spheres, but those specific techniques of extracting and selling oil demanded the development over several decades of new kinds of workers, of property rights, engineering skills, geological uh, and economic knowledge, methods of accounting, and political forces. So each of the chapters investigates um, how the building of alliances and connections between the oil and that infrastructure reconfigured the local politics of the oil regions in southwest Iran, and how those arrangements in turn shaped the, the, the building of the Iranian state, as well as the transnational oil corporation. Um, now, in terms of the specific steps involved, which I'll quickly trace, um, in the early years, oil companies either purchased land with potential oil reserves from landowners, or they signed oil concessions um, with foreign governments in regions extending from Pennsylvania Texas and California in the US to the oil fields of Baku in Russia, Sumatra in Indonesia, Austrian Galicia and Romania. By 1910, they had extended their concessionary reach to Latin America, so Mexico, uh, Venezuela, um, and the oil fields of the Middle East, um, not only in Iran, but Iraq and Egypt. Um, and so, um, you know, with this proliferation of access to these properties, 
the companies um, started to make their fortunes by monopolizing control over everything from the production wells to the transport and distribution um, via these new technologies, so pipelines um, and tankers, um, but also the marketing arrangements um, that were required to sell the oil. And so they were rivals, these um, emergent oil companies, in terms of controlling the flow of oil from the wellhead to the market. But they also happened to coordinate um, uh, in managing production and pricing during reoccurring periods of oil glut, because you know you, it, it, it would take time to build um, consumers and an industry that was heavily reliant. Um, on the oil. So one example is this Red Line Agreement, um, which was signed in 1928, and was this agreement um, involving um, the sort of dominant oil companies along with Anglo-Iranian to control rates of production, so no member would produce without the agreement of the other members, um, and a subsequent agreement followed to, to control the pricing. Um, now, AIOC compared to Standard Oil or Royal Dutch Shell um, was relatively small, so it was incredibly vulnerable um, to the growing power of these world oil cartels. Um, they, it also had this peculiar status. I mentioned that the uh, British Admiralty had purchased um, sort of a, a large stake in the company. Um, to access fuel oil during World War I, and so it was semi-nationalized um, in a sense. So as um, growing powers such as the U.S. and Russia, um, who uh, possess, even though these powers possess large reserves, Britain, as, an, as another imperial power, did not. Um, so how would it go about kind of making a, making a success of itself and, and, and producing a profit? Um, especially when it was reliant on the oil reserves of a foreign country. So my question again um, overall is to ask about the techniques and controls that a private company with special British government backing um, would rely on to transform itself in, as we all know, one of the largest um, international oil companies um, in the world. Um, so I will just give you a few examples. Um, there's one other um, kind of framing that in, uh, informs why I, I take the approach that I do, and that is the work of an Iranian political scientist, um, Hossein Mahdavi, who first coined the term frontier state. Um, so, and he was studying Iran's economic history in the 20th century. Um, he argued that Iran's trajectory was particular, yet generally applicable to other Middle East uh, oil-producing countries reliant on rents, but they face similar obstacles to democracy. But again, these studies say little about the oil operations themselves, about the infrastructure that's required to produce, circulate, and sell the oil. Um, and so it was a, a, a number of technical arrangements, human forces, political powers, and expertise that I map out um, and argue were necessary um, to make this all possible. Um, so a lot of the disputes that I tra track um, have to do with um, information management and technical and economic calculation. Um, and, and this was to ensure control over profits, labor, and production. Those were the three um, key variables. Um, but so the company's accountants and managers um, constructed um, a lot of formulas um, and concession terms and other export knowledge, expert knowledge about the oil um, to, to, to build a world, and it was a world that was advantageous to them. Um, now, in the different variants that emerge over the course of five decades, the company enacted several political arrangements between which the Iranian government, oil workers, and public opinion uh, were expected to choose. So this is just uh, an image of the 1901 concession terms. There are several articles. Um, and so, uh, you know, rival oil firms were scrambling for, to control these kinds of concessions to protect um, oil markets and keep their profits high. Um, and it's in the interwar years that we see the eruption of a series of concession disputes um, in Iran that increasingly involve the question of national control. 
Um, and so in, in, in an example that will follow, um, I'll show you that the company responded uh, oftentimes by constructing mathematical formulas, but also legal arguments and scientific representations about the oil to create these new spaces for negotiation and to manage uh, political outcomes more favorably to support its concessionary authority and to undermine ultimately the sovereignty um, of the Iranian state. So um, just to visualize this before I get to the, to the formula, um, this is an image of the oil well in 1908, the first oil well at Masjid Soleiman. Um, and it required a small detachment of troops from India, interestingly, to, pr to provide security and protect the, the sort of foreign drillers involved. Um, the company uh, ultimately was formed with the backing of the Burma Oil Company, so replacing William Knox Darcy's interests. Um, this is the area around the future refinery, so Abadan um, uh, bordering the Gulf, um, and there was this uh, waterway that was um, used um, during the period of construction to become the largest um, refinery in the world, where um, you know, tankers would arrive to load the oil and, and take it abroad. I mentioned um, nomadic groups who had claims to the lands where the oil was produced, uh, transported, and sold. One group was Arabic-speaking, led by Sheikh Khazal. Another group was uh, Farsi-speaking, the Bakhtiari Khans, who also were enrolled as labor and as guards for security. Um, there were many other kind of secret arrangements. So here I've noted that a Bakhtiari oil company was created, and this was sort of to bypass in the early years um, the, the, the central government's authority um, and to ensure security in the oil regions. This is an image of the um, local laborers laying a pipeline. Um, and so in, um, in the book, I talk about um, how the company has a kind of legacy or colonial legacy in terms of its political method of establishing um, control. Um, a lot of the British staff had experience in colonial India. Um, the future chairman of the company, John Cadman, was a colonial advisor to the British government until he was hired by the company in 1921. <coughs> Um, here's another image of the laborers. This is the first wage, set of wages that was handed out. Um, in the sort of early decades, uh, British and Russian um, influence was dominant in the north and south of the country. Um, we find that uh, the, the Pahlavi monarchy sort of comes to power in this period, um, is overthrown and replaced um, in the, thank you, um, around World War II. And I also already mentioned that the Admiralty switches from coal to fuel oil, um, and, and that kind of allows this peculiar status of the company as um, semi-nationalized, um, but also sort of connected to the question of British Empire in the region. Um, there were a lot of problems that emerged in terms of understanding the oil and, and, and as well as how to manage the labor um, in terms of housing and work. Um, this is an image of the Shah uh, Reza Pahlavi, um, who was installed in 1921, around the same time as the company was expanding. There were a number of oil worker strikes, um, one in 1929 by Iranian workers. Um, there was a previous one led by Indian workers who were significant labor um, in 1922. Um, concessionary disputes um, erupted, um, as I mentioned before, around production, labor, um, and profits. And, and um, one major um, sort of point was the cancellation of the 1901 concession and its revision in 1933. Um, this is an image of the housing for foreign labor, which you can see is quite extravagant and green with bungalow-style um, homes. On the other hand, this is slightly blurry, but this is the housing for um, a lot of local labor who ended up living in shanty towns outside um, of oil operations. So just to end with a, a specific example of um, the formulas that were used um, to manage political uh, outcomes, 
Um, there was this specific um, formula um, that was used to um, control the company's labor recruitment. So was, there was, of course, this dispute over Persianizing the workforce, um, where the Iranian government was demanding that local labor be trained at higher skill levels to replace foreign labor, especially in this um, context of uh, sort of anti-colonial national struggle um, within the region. Um, and so um, this is just a quote from a specific document by uh, one of the British company managers who argued that in order to deal with this question of Persianizing the workforce, why don't we construct a formula? Um, uh, he says, a production plan alone is far too ephemeral, but a production pl plan and a formula as the uh, semblance of some substance, our reluctance to imply that we can make a definite numerical reduction in our foreign employees each year um, is due to the uncertainties brought about by the fluctuations in the program of work and throughput. And so it goes on to describe what the accountant can do to make this, this sort of uh, desire to delay Persianization possible. And it actually ends up being this formula that I've mapped out here and discuss. Um, and um, you know, so that dispute uh, over Persianization goes on. There are further strikes. <coughs> Um, in 1946 and, and further negotiations over uh, royalties. Um, and then we end uh, with the nationalization crisis um, in 1951. So I will just simply make a final comment about how this connects to my current work, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, I continue to think about this question of economic calculation, but also um, environmental calculation. Um, in my new work um, that is about the development of um, water in Khuzestan province, so in the same area where the oil was um, discovered and produced um, in the mid-20th century, I'm looking at the role of um, the World Bank and other American consulting engineering firms in attempting con to construct a large-scale dam, um, you know, near the the, the oil fields, um, to uh, pursue to develop industrial agriculture um, and electric power, and how it was um, a massive failure for um, you know in thinking about the the, the the local population, and it all entailed. Um, a, new kinds of economic um, calculation, specifically something called cost-benefit analysis, um, but also new kinds of um, representation of the soil as well to justify the World Bank um, you know, offering loans to the Iranian government. So I will stop there and um, allow the questions. Great. Thanks. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Um, so, Noor, would you like to yeah. go first? Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to thank you so much for being here. Um, earlier on, I did a podcast with her, and it was quite interesting. The answers were very fun, so if you do have time, please listen to it. Um, so for me, this book offers a fascinating history into the history of oil in Iran in a way that not many have delved into. I mean, this is starting to change for the better, but... It's, it was quite early, a few years ago, 2018? Yeah. Um, so we start, so I read this book last year while I was doing my master's here at SOAS. In all honesty, it is a book I can just pick up and read again and again. It is very easy to read, um, very interesting. It's got everything you need in it from CIA coups to <laughs> <laughs> labor unions. I mean, like, what more do you want? <laughs> um, and I, I found it so refreshing to have a book that doesn't approach oil in the Middle East as this natural resource ticking time bomb that as a direct result of the financial rent it provides is the reason why these countries don't democratise. To actually look at the sort of techno, techno social properties of oil and how it was these properties that shaped the region as opposed to just oil and the rent it provides. Um, so like for far too long techniques of extraction, transportation, oil workers' rights, and all these large-scale feats of engineering that we now take for granted, um, they've just been neglected in approaching these natural resources and how these natural resources impacted societal development and political spheres, not only in the MENA region, but like other countries as well across the globe. So 
This book draws, I don't know how many of you have read it, if not you should all read it front, front page to back. But um, Timothy draws on a lot of work by Timothy Mitchell um, in the field of STS, and who doesn't love an STS approach to oil? <laughs> it's so interesting. Um, like building on his work, we discussed things like you know the very fact that oil was a liquid that needed a far smaller workforce. It had completely different properties to coal, so it didn't provide the same sort of changes, industrial revolution thing. Like things that occurred in the Western world didn't occur in the same way simply because oil was a different material property. Um, we can learn a great deal by moving away from like conventional ways of approaching fossil fuels, not just historically but in other fields as well. Um, but it's not just the physical material properties of oil that I find, like this book that discusses Abdul Neglected in an explanation surrounding the Middle East political and democratic circumstance, but things like labour recruitment policies at the AIOC and other companies shut Iranian workers out, inhibiting the formation and growth of unions that we know were pivotal in the 20th century to the rights we've got today, particularly labour rights. Um, another really interesting thing about this book I really liked was um, so we, when we talk about OPEC being this cartel that controlled oil, this, there were companies doing this in uh, the interwar period, in like the 1920s, like controlling, making this sort of artificial system whereby oil seemed scarce, even though it was in abundance. But we kind of assumed that was something that OPEC started first, like typically, but it wasn't really. Um, and my favourite chapter in this book was chapter four, um, discussing the oil, what, like the oil industry workers. Um, not just because it approaches the history of oil in the Middle East from the perspective of the oil worker, not the oil broker, something I think is deeply lacking in historical discussions surrounding fossil fuels in all part of the globe. But it bring, by bringing the lens onto these oil workers, it helps us develop a far better understanding of the political struggles the country was facing, but particularly during the interwar period and Iran's decision to nationalise in '51. It was these organised industrial strikes, not just from Iranian oil workers, but from Indian and Arab oil workers too, that began to push for the ousting of British hegemony over Iranian oil. So, I mean, like, despite the challenges that the material properties of oil placed upon these workers to strike, coupled with the AIOC's racialised division of labour, their use of paternalism, they, they striked, I mean, they were accused of being communist influence, but they striked. Um, simply asking for better treatment and wages. And one thing that I found really interesting is the, and I had never thought that, you know, it's fascinating to think about it happening now, but about the Iranian government. So it's like the government of a state having to go to an, like an international body, the International Labour Organization, to deal with the problems its own workers were dealing with the AI. Like you wouldn't imagine in the modern day and age, a nation having to go to an international governing body to, to fight for its workers' rights. It, doesn't, it just doesn't comprehend in the 21st century. Um, the question I want to ask is, do you think that the Anglo-Iranian oil company's policies with regards to the oil workers evoked the fires of nationalism in Iran or prevented nationalism in Iran from developing earlier? Okay, um, and then um, Anna? Yes. Um, hello, um, I am Anam and I will be uh, presenting my reflections on this very interesting book, Machineries of Oil, and on how it uh, breaks down oil production into its uh, constituents and how different actors, human and non-human, interact with each other to first build on a larger narrative that we now have about oil production in the Middle East, and second, to show us how to break away from that narrative. So um, thank you for coming here. Thank you for the talk and for writing this book that um, for me moved away from the, the conventional normative understanding of Arab and Iranian racial, uh, racialization regarding oil and authoritarianism. So um, to begin with, one thing that uh, struck me the most was the constant uh, breakdown of binaries that seemed fixed to us when understanding the colonial uh, the colonizing logic, such as um, the binary of the political and the technical. Because in the case of Iran and its oil production, we, we can see how the, the materiality of oil production is largely infused with the proliferation of non-human actors, whether it's in the form of international law, techno-scientific expertise, or the concession contract terms, and how these uh, uh, non-human actors were also 
working towards um, you know the the racialization of uh, Arab Iranian and Indian identity um, so I to give an example I think uh, the book uh, in the book that you were proposing that the British built a narrative that oil production is only to be handled by experts who have the technical knowledge about oil production which I think is the first point towards uh, the racialization because you're using this argument that even though the technicality of uh, oil production cannot be taken for granted, it is still those technical tools that the British used that authenticates or justifies them having an edge over production of oil in Iran. So at the time, I think there was more of a focus on the agency that was given to technical knowledge, which eliminates the political aspect of oil production in Iran. And uh, this was also done through the introduction of uh, formulas um, which uh, one which was regarding the 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 constraint the the royalties that constrained oil production uh, which was also suitable for the uh, for AIOC to maintain its allies with the seven systems whatever was happening internationally um, and as well as the introduction of formulas regarding how many Iranians can be included in the workforce or the Persianization of workforce which uh, was determined by the total expenditure of the company so this is another instance when the when I think that the binary between the political and the technological sphere of oil production is used as uh, a way to conceal racialization where the technical rationale is somehow nat uh, naturalized. And um, I believe you're also pointing out that it is because of this naturalization that the Iranian labor started retaliating in the first place because despite oil production having a technical side to it, there was still an element of agency that the Iranian labors had to go on strikes regarding their working condition, wages, housing conditions, and so forth. Which uh, brings me to my question, or just more of a clarity on the need to on the need to bring in Indian labor in Iran. Um, I understand that you've mentioned that the British used the argument that oil production required skilled labors, um, which was not easily found in Iran, according to them. But do you think that there was any other agenda to bring in the Indian workforce because I was thinking along the lines that um, whether you think that the racialization of uh, that the Iranians felt was further strengthened by this influx of Indian workforce or not and uh, secondly uh, so this might also just be an observation but I could see um, this, uh, the implicit elements of colonialism throughout the book and the integral relation that colonialism and AIOC had, but can you draw some parallels between AIOC and the East India Company and the subcontinent? And uh, this, uh, the, the last question is just because my interest is in religion and politics, so I just wanted to ask like a broader question that do you think that religion played as one of the actors at all? Uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Great, thank you. So um, would you like to respond? To and then we'll bring it uh, open to, to the floor. <clears throat> sure. Um, so, Noor, I just want to make sure I understood. Um, so, did BP or did AIOC evoke national feelings or um, did they block them from happening earlier? Um, so, did they, like, did they evoke feelings, like, did they evoke nationalism within the population mm -hmm. or did, were they actively hindering the process of nationalization? Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, and if you're thinking about the 1920s, when you start to see these um, workers dis attempting to disrupt um, operations to make demands uh, for better treatment, um, this is obviously in a larger context of anti-colonial nationalism emerging, I mean, in the Middle East, but also in other parts of the world. Um, <laughs> and so um, I would say that you know, if even if there wasn't necessarily an explicit statement about uh, nation making, maybe not in the early 1920s, it was more about kind of wages and treatment and training. By 1929, when you have this um, uh, significantly organized um, Iranian labor strike, um, you, it's 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 I, def I I definitely see it as a kind of dress rehearsal for oil nationalization in the 1950s. Um, and so the work that the British company did in terms of building a kind of racialized hierarchy, um, which I forget your name, 
Adam. 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 Adam uh, raised um, definitely helped uh, sort of to hinder the possibility of you know local uh, laborers having the knowledge and the skills to either have make you know make decisions about how profits uh, were distributed, but also ultimately to to achieve um, some sort of sovereignty over their resources. Yeah. And then um, the next question about um, Indian labor. Um, yeah, so I think um, if you look at um, the activities of these firms who were extracting mineral resources around the world, there is the element of, of obviously race and, and building a racial hierarchy um, to, to control and determine, you know, how profits are distributed and to who and to maintain obviously a power imbalance and so yeah bringing in um, Indian labor skilled Indian labor from abroad um, definitely helped um, the company to achieve this kind of enclave that somehow excluded um, you know the possibility of, it, of, of either training or, or enrolling locals who um, uh, could have, you know, participated in the, um, the, the the activities that the Indian labor. I mean, they were mainly clerks, but also operated at the worked at the refinery, um, and and they might have had training in Southeast Asia, in Rangoon, um, in Burma, for example. Um, but it was definitely advantageous for the company to bring them in, also because at the time in the 1920s, for example, you it was acceptable to deport them if they went on strike. So the use of force to eliminate disruption was possible um, at the time. And racism, you know, was being practiced <laughs> around the world. Um, colonizing, yeah, I mean, there are interesting parallels. I, I mention it just because thinking about the role of these oil companies as a new kind of political actor and what it tells us about new forms of empire in the mid 20th century. So there is this comparison you could make with East India where in the older um, kind of mode of colonizing, um, you could simply go into a foreign country and, and annex land and exploit resources by imperial edicts, so by the permission of the king or queen. Um, uh, and so that kind of changes, you know, after uh, later on, but um, uh, this, this concessionary arrangement definitely has the colonial um, legacy, um, which is why it's so contentious, I guess, starting in the 1920s, um, as sovereignty, claims to sovereignty, develop. But also the use of violence, I guess, um, in the sense that the colonizing companies were not um, uh, subjects of the law of the foreign countries, so they were not they were exempt, you know, uh, from any kind of consequence to the exercise of violence or force in the countries where they were extracting resources. And so you see that the company sort of gets away with it initially in terms of perhaps deporting Indian labor or mistreating Iranian workers, but they also that they have to change their methods. It's no longer possible to explicitly um, use violence and, and rely on racial hierarchy to exclude. So there's also a shift. There are similarities and differences. Uh, religion. Um, that's interesting. I I mean I haven't I didn't think about it too much because I didn't see it um, a lot in the documents. I know from photos that there was a temple that the Indian labor had um, in and it was in located in Abadan um, that they worshipped at. Um, I also know that. <coughs> Islam played a role in, in, in some of the protests of family members of women, um, which Stephanie Cronin? Yeah, Stephanie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think she's written about it, actually. Um, so it does play a role in religion. It obviously comes up in, um, from time to time, depending on the factions involved in the nationalization crisis. But in terms of the labor, there are some specific um, yeah, occasions where it comes up. Um, okay, great. So um, I'll open up now to the audience. So uh, what we're going to do is we'll have an extended uh, period time for um, questions and comments. Um, and then maybe for like 20 minutes or so. And then I'll bring Katoyun back in to, to respond to them. And then we'll do that again. Um, so please. Uh, yes. 
I haven't read your book. Uh, thank you very much. And, but um, do, do you, did you cover the great starvation during 1970-19 that was related to the contract, the secret uh, agreement between Russian and British, and then British uh, landed 400,000 people in the country that was neutral. Uh, you know, they announced it publicly they are neutral. And then, as a result, we had the biggest Holocaust in the world. So the first Holocaust started in 1970 to 1919, and then 10 million people uh, have been died. The censor before that date and after that date showed 11 million. So it's, big, it's bigger than the Holocaust in, uh, of the Jews. But why nobody has done research? Because all of the pictures, all of the information are kept secret in America, and in, in, in Britain, we, the, this information hasn't been released. Now, the, the, also there were two other coups that uh, we mentioned. One was the Reza Shah, that was the coup, and the second one, 1953, that Iranian suffered as a result. As you mentioned, the, the plan was Ajax, and then with the uh, the uh, 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 grandchild of Roosevelt, the American, they had the coup. So as a result, Iranians suffered until 1978. If you look at our generation, we are uh, after 1953, by the revolution we were 30, 35, so uh, the, you know, the, the, the result of the, uh, what's happened in Iran reached to us, so without being prepared for revolution, we went through Islamic revolution that we suffered until now. So all of this information now we hidden. We didn't know very much about the coup. We didn't know the infrastructure of the company, like the uh, oil company. And you mentioned very casually, you said that semi-nationalized uh, company. British Petroleum being nationalized by Churchill, and Churchill was conservative. So imagine a conservative nationalizing a company that is the British and Iranian company, shows how important this company was uh, in that period, during the war, First war, world, world War, and Second World War. All of the Navy, the British Empire, British colonization, was based on a petrol, petrol that discovered in Iran, and the company that was responsible for giving this to the government. Now, most of these head of this company, they have British passport. They had diplomatic uh, immunity. They had. Uh, they were working with the government. None of them. They were independent. You know, like businessmen. At the moment, the British people, the money they paid for the Mexican gold, it was British government was paying that 31 billion uh, dollars, not not BP, not a private company, because the company has 51 percent share government 49 are private, so British people were paying. And the company moved their headquarters outside the British territory. They didn't even pay tax. So the two million tax that they hasn't paid is as a result of a company that it has more powerful than British government that operated in this country in front of everybody. Now, going back to the... Uh, Could you um, wrap up your comments? Yes. Sorry. So, sorry, I, the question really, I didn't... <laughs> I tried to... Uh, just elaborate on what I heard because uh, I'm sure in the book you have covered, you know, uh, 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 the whole the whole area. I thought these two area of starvation, the Holocaust, that uh, the country suffered, the Middle East suffered, and also the coup d'état that we suffered, the people who participated in the revolution, and we still suffered at the moment. Young people get killed. It was important to you know. A, a, a little bit elaborate on that. Anybody else? Uh, hang on, uh, Thank you so much for a great presentation and a wonderful book. Um, we really enjoyed um, reading it with um, our students last year, so um, I'm very excited to, to have you here today. Um, so one of the things that we discussed in class just before coming into this seminar um, was this question of um, the corporation and the, the, the political. Um, 
So, um, you know, you've, you've made the argument, as many other people have, that we should consider the corporation as a, as a political actor, if, you know, and if I've understood you correctly from today as well. But particularly that first chapter of yours, which I think is you know, fantastic, um, one of the things you seem to be showing us is that the corporation is not simply a political actor, but it actually constitutes the political, the boundaries of the, uh, the political, um, specifically um, in the way um, the AIOC actually negotiates with the local population in Khuzestan, so the Bakhtiaris, I suppose, or Sheikh Khazal. Um, so, I, yeah, I'd love to hear more about how you um, conceptualize and think about the role of the corporation as something that constitutes the bounds of what we understand today to be modern state sovereignty, um, something which obviously we can't necessarily project back to Qajar Iran or you know, 19, 1901. Um, I have some other questions, but I think I'll wait for um, an, yeah, another round. Because, uh, just on that, because in the historiography, we still it's still dominated by this idea of there being state and society in the 19, in the nineteenth century. Yeah. Um, so, are you pushing back against that kind of um, analysis? I guess. Um, uh, yeah, Gabe. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Katrin, for the presentation. It's wonderful, and thank you also for the questions from the presenters. Um, so I uh, was really excited to read the first chapter about land um, in part because I found a lot of similar um, practices going on in Basra in se I mean several decades later but um, in terms of the uh, basically the the flattening of all these very complex forms of land tenure into state land mm -hmm. um, but what was interesting in the case of Basra and I, what I wanted to know what you thought of if you know what you thought for the context of Khuzestan was how little I think it seemed to me to it's like this mattered for politics or or for even agrarian political economy um, in in Iraq uh, in southern Iraq so um, uh, even though there was dispossession you know people who who did sort of uh, uh, treat their land as alienable private property um, you know uh, commercial agricultural land agri agricultural land um, uh, and there was resettlement. Um, it never seemed to be a particularly important political issue around oil. I mean, ba basically, uh, everyone kind of accepted. It seems. I mean, the kind of hegemonic discourse around oil was that we need to produce as much of it as possible. Um, and so, if there are expropriations that happen, if they even acknowledge them as happening, um, whether and this is both in the popular press, but then also among state officials, um, then it's just sort of necessary. For the, for the erection of an, of an oil apparatus, even under the auspices of a British-led corporation. And then it continues to be the case after nationalization. Um, so I was kind of interested, and this may also be the fact that like people were already leaving the countryside in great numbers by the 1940s and 1950s, so commercial agriculture was a lot less important. But I wonder if you could speak about um, some of the, um, how much this matter for politics around, around land and the grand political economy. Um, the collapsing of land tenure. And then a second question I had, which was, um, if you took the story sort of past nationalization, what, um, is it the same kinds of political control that, that the oil company, as a national oil company, um, uh, exercises through, you know, technical, you know, control over, I think for you said it was the big thing was like management of information. Um, or do the relationships between you know state and society via the oil company are they changing in the era of nationalization, or is it more that the kind of ruling coalitions that control the Iranian state apparatus just sort of inherit this this thing called the oil company and, and all the kinds of political relationships that come with it? I hope, is that clear? Okay, thanks. Yes, Bianca Murray. Yeah. Um, so uh, we discussed, I mean, we briefly glossed over this point, which I thought um, it was really interesting in class today. And it was, um, it had to do with like the, um, like the theological implications of um, how you talk about oil. Um, I, I'll try to explain it. So, um, I mean, like the common sense is that like oil is um, the the raw material that makes global capitalism um, go about, and everyone believes that 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 
that's um, that, that's the case, obviously. But like you in um, your book, you complexify the relationship that oil has to society, and in some ways, you kind of try to um, strengthen the connection that oil has with society, and, and in some sense, you I, like I see some sort of. Um, like desacralization of oil, I'm not sure, but um, yeah, I, like with, with Hengame today, we kind of discussed how um, in like oil kind of like defines the bedrock of um, like our like metaphysical, um, the, like the metaphysical world of like techno scientism in some ways. And I don't know if uh, you had any thoughts about this or if um yeah i i hope i didn't waffle that much but uh yeah that was my take there. um i have a question about um sts science and technology studies um so one of the i mean this this seminal series about histories of capitalism and race mm -hmm. And I was wondering um, what you think an STS approach specifically can do to enhance our understanding of uh, histories of capitalism and race, or the way that um, uh, race is kind of mobilized within especially uh, sort of socio-technical assemblages. Um, so maybe if you could say a bit more, maybe for those who, who didn't get the chance to read, maybe if you could elaborate on how this how race is sort of made technical mm -hmm. as well. Uh, is there anyone who else hasn't spoken yet? Just prior to John Michael. Um, so I have a question. Um, it's kind of going off of the notion of the, the properties of labor around oil, um, because it's building off of you know carbon democracy, you know, the notion that coal has more points of labor that makes it harder to or makes it easier for labor to disrupt the production of it. And oil is, you know, much easier uh, for, you know, corporations and states to get around labor. Um, but I found it was really interesting because your book focuses a lot about labor issues still. And, um, like, it, it seems that the strikes were relatively effective and relatively important in terms of the nationalizing of it. So I wondered if you could go into a little bit about how your work might push it back against that from that like simple notion of you know coal easy or hard to control and oil easy to control. Um, and I wonder if you have any thoughts in terms of that direction. Okay, are you done? And then and then I'll bring Kathy in and, and right. then we'll do another round. All right. Um, Sorry, okay. Uh, you done? Sorry. Right. So I have a question about like even though this book is defined as like a book mainly talks about the STA studies, mm -hmm. but I found actually, I mean, the legal aspects has a very significant place in this book. In chapter 3, chapter 5, and chapter 6, actually the British government and the Iranian government both use the kind of legal weapons to contest against each other, just like the Iranian government is trying to, was trying to imposing a nationalization project and the, like on the other side the British government is trying to use like you know the weapon of international law a so called internationalization project to counter back to counter against the actions done by the Iranian government and you have mentioned that here this this problem, this question emerges within the international law era. Like, could a, could a nation state, I mean British government, could a nation state consider itself uh, as on behalf of a private company? Because, I mean here, it considers a great private company as kind of British national. So here is kind of like a fictional legal person. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could elaborate more about this kind of uh, fictional legal person in, I mean, as a private company. However, when it's 
emerges into the international law area and it has been trans transformed into a state or like it can be represent or equal to a state, a sovereign state. I think if you explain more about this, I would be very glad to hear. I mean like uh, STS historians uh, viewpoints about the legal history and like how the studies of legal history, how could it like entangle with the history of technology and scientific and studies, etc. Yes. So I'll bring Kathleen and then we'll have another round of questions. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll just I numbered the. Oh sure, yeah, order. sure, yeah. Whatever order you prefer. How much time? Just yeah. let me know if we're running out of time. Sure, sure. <laughs> so the first question. I mean, thank you. I um, I, I appreciated your feedback. Um, I didn't talk. This. I don't discuss the great starvation in my in my work because I'm covering five decades and. I was focusing on the BP company documents, and so the company wasn't kind of, ex you know, obviously Britain was involved um, uh, in the country in this period um, around World War I, but um, the company's trajectory was different um, and, and taking place more in the South. So it, the, this context is more simply in the book works in terms of simply outlining the international kinds of spheres of control, Russian and British, in Iran, but then focus, focusing more specifically on the question of the history of monopolies and concessions. So it's very much tied to oil. And so for that reason, I don't address um, the point, but obviously very important. I mean, if I had more space, it would be a very interesting context to explore. Um, and your points about companies and governments and that and how they actually are entangled from the start is very important and I do agree with that and argue that in the book that um, you cannot see government officials, British business financiers as, having, as separate um, entities even though they insist on that those boundaries. They very much insist on government over here, private company over here. So I definitely trace the process through which those boundaries are insisted on, even though in practice that is not how it works, of course. So um, thank you for your comments. Um, the second, I don't know who gave this. It was about corporations and uh, oh, constituting the political. Was that yes, you? Know? yes. Yeah. Okay, that was a good question. Yeah. So yeah, um, uh, and you also mentioned international law. So and the question of sovereignty. I mean, it's a perfect. The international law question is perfect for showing how. Um, the company very much needs to define, you know, in order for it to be able to maintain its power and exercise its agency, it needs to define new spaces in which it can exercise its control. And, you know, the international arena was believed to be a place where the company and the British government might be supported. And then they discover that, no, actually, international opinion supports um, sovereignty and you know these emergent formerly colonized states having control over the resources increasingly from the 30s through to the 50s and so you see how um, the company and the British government are attempting to carve um, new spaces to assert their political agency by arguing that um, the company is a British national so the point that um, you raised is an example of we of something we hadn't seen before where um, international law doesn't actually allow for companies to act. Um, international law was created for states to resolve issues and to avoid war. And so this the, the case of Iran is, 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 is shows an instance where this company is carving out a political space for itself in international law. Um, that allows it to argue against, um, you know, the cases made by um, na uh, national governments over their their uh, natural resources. And even though in the cases that I look at, the Iranian government seems to gain an advantage. In the end, you see how these concession contracts and the question of arbitration or how to resolve disputes over these contracts 
end up benefiting foreign private interests in terms of what replaces concessionary contracts. We get new kinds of commercial contract um, in international law through this um, notion of arbitration, which can only take place in international law that carves out the space for these companies to exercise their power and maintain it. And it is obviously political because they're hindering um, the exercise of sovereignty by these states that are also quite vocal in the 60s and 70s. Um, so yeah, I guess hopefully that gives you a little bit. Um, the property question is really interesting. Um, so yeah, I mean, you're right, because the, the question of property as it concerns oil doesn't really, it doesn't obviously <coughs> deal so much with agrarian property relations. Um, I guess, I mean, in, the, in what I looked at, um, the large landowners were these nomadic groups, so the Bakhtiari Khans and the Sheikh. And what ends up happening is um, this battle over the definition of state control over the subsoil. Um, so, so in that sense, it's simply this kind of redef you know, either ignoring the deeds or the claims, because obviously, in for example, in the case of Khazal, you had these farmans, which were you know these edicts that you know granted or acknowledged the the so-called owners the ownership of of land or the claim to land and how that um, gets erased i mean so Khazal, um, uh, he is imprisoned and he sort of his life ends very uh, in, a, in a bad way so and and on the Bakhtiari side they are indebted even though they exercise control um, over the land, um, they're indebted um, because precisely because the state control over the subsoil is important. But um, yeah, so I'm not, you know, it's interesting. I haven't really thought about how we can expand it. I mean, it would come up more in my wa the water stuff um, because again, it's this battle between large landowners and local farmers and how, um, and so in that case, it's about um, organizing them in large industrial in large estates where they will kind of follow these new methods of farming and you know the land is oftentimes owned by these large landowners and so there's always this question of, of, of access and, and who owns it and how do we um, control the land even though we don't own it and so I mean, it's a, it, these cases all have to do with foreign entities intervening in property relations so I couldn't say too much about um, trends in agrarian property relations more generally, but um, there is this misunderstanding of how property works in these local contexts, not just in scholarship, but also by the actors. So it's worth investigating further. Um, the fourth question was about nationalization. Oh, looking past nationalization. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that um, power relations shift um, after the 1950s. Um, so thinking about OPEC, the rise of OPEC, and how you see these producer countries reproducing those old cartel arrangements, um, such as the Red Line Agreement. So coming to an agreement about how to manage production and pricing to ensure um, higher profits. So those kinds of, that old that power dynamic and that structuring of, of how oil is produced and sold is maintained. Um, but there is this ongoing battle with the largest um, Anglo-American American oil companies to you know, not to allow um, too much control uh, to to go to the to the side of the oil producers, and they get away with it in terms of um, these new kinds of devices, such as national security, so protecting oil supplies for the free world, um, so and which therefore justifies all kinds of military foreign intervention, the construction of military bases. You see in Saudi. Um, for a time, the selling of weapons to Iran, um, up to the revolution, and 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 this um, kind of uh, circulation of of oil dollars um, to arms manufacturers in the West. Um, and there was another point. What was the other? One? I forgot. There was one other point. But yeah, so there are similarities and differences in terms of um, new kinds of. 
power relations. Um, yeah, I don't remember anything else. Oh, a question about STS, maybe? Okay, so... Um, STS and race? STS, yes, that was a good question. So, um, so you know, in the way that I look at it, um, you know, again, yeah, it was this issue of not just thinking about race as a socially constructed institution, but also a technically constructed um, institution, whereby people are getting organized in terms of skills um, and, and how they can, and, and that is also shaped by what they are, what sorts, what sort of sorts of materials they're having to extract. The result was something for public. Anti now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Sarah. All right. Uh, thank you, Katyun, uh, for a fabulous book and for coming to our seminar this week. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm really enjoying this conversation and wanted to kind of pull a couple of threads from the first round of, um, of questions and also link it to some of the things that we've said kind of throughout the semester. Um, so one of the threads that's really interesting to me in the book and in this conversation is about kind of this personhood of the corporation and what it produces politically. Um, and I guess one of, the, one of the points that came up earlier in the seminar series, we had uh, Nada Montaz here, um, who was talking about Waqf. And she discussed the ways in which Waqf also translate or transforms into a moral person itself, as kind of the divine becomes um, re you know, uh, removed from property relations in particular ways. Um, and I guess I, you know, it was, it, you know, these threads are, are really interesting because we, when we talk about moral personhood and we talk about personhood of the non-human, a lot of the time in political economy we are focused on the corporation as this really kind of large and significant entity that's quite a bit of power in the making of capitalist relations. And I guess as I can, my question to you, or maybe open-ended, um, is whether we think there's something really special about the corporation itself um, in its stature as this kind of, you know, person or legal person, um, or if we should start to think about um, the corporation alongside the making of other kind of non-human uh, legal persons um, as a kind of proliferation of that um, as kind of a modern or part of a modern or a capitalist project. So that's kind of an open-ended question. Um, the other question um, builds on John Michael's question about um, kind of coal versus oil, labor relations, and their importance. So, like him, I kind of, you know, it's it's not just you who's talked about the importance of um, labor power, but you certainly do that in the book quite a bit. Um, but Bob Vitalis or um, you know um, Mateen's work himself, right? Quite a bit of um, uh, kind of there's quite a bit of power behind these labor movements. Um, and it made me, you know, I kind of wanted kind of your, to kind of engage and think about whether, you know, the focus that Mitchell has in his book on carbon, demo and carbon democracy, on democracy as one of these manifestations of labor organizing around coal um, is a very specific kind of manifestation of labor power. But maybe if there are other ways for us to open up how labor power around oil manifests in quite a bit of very interesting kind of political effects. Um, so why, you know, the specificity, specificities of democracy versus these kind of uh, nationalization projects, populist projects, et cetera, um, and maybe thinking about the, the work of translation here of that labor power um, and bringing in STS on maybe other levels to think about how, um, and why maybe there are these different translations of labor power into political projects. Thank you. Ada, and then, and then yes. um, Hi, so I didn't finish the book, so I'm hoping I'm not asking you to repeat yourself. Also, it might be a bit off topic, so I apologize for all of that. Um, but I, if I understand correctly, Correctly, you're arguing that these uh, techno social political policies influence Iran's state and society or shape Iran's state and society. So I was wondering whether, how, or if they influence gender dynamics, of course, with an eye to the current situation. Uh, yeah, that's it. 
Uh, yes. Okay. Um, I guess so we've already talked kind of a little bit about the STS method, um, uh, but I also wanted to ask you if, you if you think there are pitfalls to the methodology, because I think like, you know, some of the critiques that Latour faced, which of course, like your book, I wouldn't think of it as a Latourian book, not necessarily, it's much more, much bigger emphasis on the social, um, but some of the big criticism is like, uh, if when we put the nature's actancy at the same place as people's agency, then do we risk um, actually forgiving some culpability, political culpability that that uh, human actors have in these kinds of capitalistic extraction? So I wonder if in this story, um, do you feel any, there's any risk of that at all? Um, but also I wanted to ask a separate question, and I hope, uh, and I and it's not necessarily a sort of question, it's about how we can understand the present with the help of this book. I'm, you know, some of the, one of the new kind of resources maybe to be discovered today is this thing called Bitcoin, and we use the terminology of mining when we talk about it. And I'm wondering, you know, um, is it, when, we, when you talk about oil, you talk also about how it's, the process of its extraction is so black boxed. Maybe compared to coal, for instance, which, uh, you know, because there are humans, actually doing the work of mining and it's visible to their sight, it's a lot less black boxable to humans to, uh, uh, compared to oil. And I wonder, something like Bitcoin, is that even more black boxable uh, to oil? So what can the history of oil and its extraction and its machineries kind of tell us about this current new thing we have, which kind of is a commodity, but kind of is a resource, but also is kind of a currency in a certain ways, but also exists supposedly in this denational space, but of course relies on supercomputers that require a lot of you know, fossil fuel generated energy to run so that they can actually mine these things that don't exist in physical space. So I'm wondering, yeah, what do you think uh, the history of oil extract extraction can tell us about this, this current moment? Uh, hang on, man. Um, I have a question about um, the argument you make about technical skills um, and uh, the racialization of the, the workforce. And my question is, how um, new or unique is this moment that you're presenting for us? Um, so I suppose I'm, I'm asking whether um, differentiating the workforce in, in accordance to different skills. I mean, this is something that probably has a longer kind of colonial genealogy of thinking about different racial groups in terms of having certain characteristics like being, I don't know, um, militarily sort of capable and, and so on. But is there something new that is that is going on here that we might want to be mindful of? Is this a um, you know an early early moment of something that we're living with today um, and if so what it, what it, what is what is that is it about the um, use of ma mathematical formulas um, is it about economic uh, kind of knowledge to statistical knowledge um, yeah I'd be grateful if you could maybe elaborate a little bit on that and then just kind of jumping um, off of your dance question um, I think it's less intuitive um, for some of us um, or for, for some, of, some of our students, um, when we talk about STS, law doesn't seem to be the obvious sort of target um, for that kind of approach. So I think it would be really great to hear from you what an STS approach to the law looks like for people who might want to do that kind of research or who might want to write a paper that takes you know, um, the law as a kind of technology that can be um, disassembled and, and reassembled. Yeah. Johara? Uh, I just have one uh, sort of question in terms of, um, in, particularly in your chapter on workers, uh, you refer to a lot of interviews, for example, Ghulami Ranavati and others. And you know, in, in a region where you still do have the remnants of um, of these kinds of you know different uh, of these uh, of the uh, of the AIOC, you know, with in terms of the bungalows and the physical presence of uh, uh, of these oil corporations. Um, what are how are people remembering um, this history? What are the current narratives surrounding this particular history, and uh, what is the focus 
is it on a sort of a you know a corporation colonial approach to you know to life there is it about um, oil production in the economy is it about you know the changing legal status is it about you know sort of the in the um, labor reforms uh, is it about w the workers and is it about the people how is it being memorialized or how is it being remembered and recollected um, in contemporary society since this is such a recent history um, okay, I'm going to bring you back in because uh, we have to finish at seven because Iran is playing USA in the World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> okay, uh, so yeah, oh, uh, please. Okay. Um, thank you for all of your questions. They're all really good questions. Um, the first one I have is about, I think, it personhood. Um, so, I mean, when I talk about it, um, yeah, the, in the it, it's about the company um, acting um, as if it's a British national. But um, I'm not you know, saying that it has any kind of personhood per se, but you see how it, it's achieving that effect in the law. Um, so, um, I'm trying to read my own writing, consider. Um, so did you ask if there was something special about this? Yeah, I mean, in other like non-human sort of legalized in law, I mean, I'm, so you just, so I mean, that's the big event in um, 1951 when the case, go, the nationalization case goes to the International Court of Justice because um, uh, there, there's that, but what precedes it is in the inclusion of this article, ar an article on arbitration. So, how do you resolve economic development agreements? So, agreements between foreign, um, uh, you know, companies, usually Western, uh, coming into non-Western uh, countries to to make business, um, and so. Um, so, so yeah, so this idea that we need to include an arbitration clause is now solidified in 1951, whereas in 1901, um, you don't, that clause isn't there. There was only the idea of having an independent um, umpire to resolve disputes. So the inclusion of arbitration, interestingly, even though Iran would agree to it because it was a member of the League of Nations followed by the United Nations, on the other hand, it could risk working disadvantageously if a court rules that jurisdiction is um, to be maintained in an international arena instead of a national arena. So that kind of battle. Um, yeah, and then of course, so I've written an article about it. It's called Technopolitics of a Concessionary Contract, where I do Argue, you know, explain how we can use STS. Um, so thinking about law as infrastructure, as a kind of informational infrastructure. So instead of thinking about law as another kind of technical field like science or engineering, that its very construction involves decisions about the political and the economic and also the social, because that also comes up in these legal proceedings um, that I follow. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry, my brain is now <laughs> not so. <laughs> um, the next question is, um, yeah, so the coal oil, because I forgot to address that before, um, and, this, and, and democracy. I mean, so I am agreeing with the carbon democracy argument, because the idea is that there is something different about the oil. So it is a useful comparison to make um, in the sense that oil workers did not succeed at intervening in the decision-making process to redistribute the um, way in which um, not only the oil was produced, just in terms of the amounts of oil, but also the, its sale and how much profit could be used by you know, labor. Um, whereas coal workers were much more successful. They are, they are both, in both instances, having power over the generation of enormous amounts of wealth, which obviously would attract the attention of the state, 
but in the case of oil because of the access to tankers, the access to other sources of oil, even when we have these um, national strikes, which were very important. I mean, the 1946 strike does achieve a degree of success in terms of national legislation that provides more welfare and, and better wages and limited um, working hours. Nonetheless, um, you don't see a any change in terms of their power in making decisions about the generation of the wealth and how it gets distributed. So that radical kind of effect is what I meant. But you can obviously disagree. I mean, um, let me just see if there's anything. But I do think that idea of how we translate, like this idea of translation, um, and how we think about practices of labor and how th their specificity, depending on what um, you know, materials are, are, are being engaged with, um, do does matter. And so we can trace, um, there's a lot of difference, but we, we can also trace some similarities um, as well. But yeah, thinking about translation is, is useful. Um, gender, of course, I agree. I mean, I did not think about, I mean, this is obviously a male um, workforce, but on the other hand, there were, of course, families, so females and, and female children, and the pamphlets that the company produced show female nurses and teachers and mothers. I mean, you do have female labor um, involved, so yeah, you, that is missing, the sort of kind of gendered um, analysis. Um, where I would think about how to use the, the technical question. I mean, obviously it, it's there in the sense that the, the company is drawing from male labor to, to um, pursue oil operations, but we can also talk about the silencing of the, of the females and how, in fact, they were participating in protests. Like Stephanie Cronin has written about it, their role in, in protest and gender relations. Um, the pitfalls of STS. Um, so if I understand, I mean, I guess it just depends on how we think about the political and whether we think it resides in, um, I guess, human kind of determined, de humans determining outcomes or not, if that's what you meant. Um, and how we think about power and whether it's distributed um, or not, and yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. it. Depends on how what persuades you more, I guess. I am more persuaded by the idea that you cannot, humans cannot account for the logics that the oil has and the machinery has, and the uncertainty that's introduced um, that doesn't allow for the humans to determine outcomes necessarily. So I think there is uncertainty and instability um, introduced as well as um, impa a a an impact in terms of power relations. So yeah, it's hard for me to necessarily favor the human side. I just think it, it's, but it's more interesting to think about the constant um, interaction and interconnection and the co-construction. But I see, I, uh, that is a fair criticism. Um, understanding, yeah, the my, that's a great project. The Bitcoin, that's a great project. Uh, the STS project, because um, mm -hmm. it's this kind of effect of dematerialization, but at the same time, there's a lot of materiality, right? Because of the energy consumption. Um, I mean, just looking at FTX, I mean, there was a, there were a, there were people, lots of people involved. There was a lot of production of information and management of information, a lot of accounting tricks, um, a lot of secrecy and transparency in terms of the advertising of FTX and connections made to powerful figures. But on the other hand, you know, in the black box, you know, how <laughs> where's the value of this of this currency, and and where are the customer deposits <laughs> that are getting transferred, you know? And so I I think um, it's another kind of black box. It's you can use um, you know, it's they're they're not as you know they're not 
international corporations as we see them, um, but they are operating in a similar way perhaps to derivatives or, I mean, there is a kind of um, formulation that's black box um, that people don't necessarily understand. And, you know, there are a lot of SCS scholars that work on this actually, like Donald McKenzie, for example. Um, so, yeah, I think y you, can, you can use a similar method. Um, let's see, technical skills. Maybe time for Sorry, one more. Okay. okay. Um, um, I guess I'll just do the remembering question. I mean, I didn't um, do too much, uh, conduct too many interviews. I did make the go to the oil, to Khuzestan. Um, and I spoke to some to people, and then I found a few interviews. So yeah, the mem memories are varied. Of, um, you know, some are more cultural. I mean, speaking to a taxi driver, for example, they, a young taxi driver, obviously, they were kind. It was a kind of amusement with um, the fact that you know the roads had lane in the name or. Um, the structure of the bungalows, you know, was still there, um, and and the fact that, that the, the architecture of the streets is wide, kind of boulevards. Um, uh, so there's that kind of thing. But then there are the the older generation who had parents, um, for example, perhaps are, are, were more aware of the violence, of the mistreatment, um, because obviously coinciding with nationalization. Um, uh, yeah, so I mean, it, it, it was varied, and I didn't conduct enough uh, interviews to, to make a, a clear assessment. But yeah, it's, it was very interesting. Um, okay, well, um, thank you so much, Kata Yoon. I mean, it's been a real pleasure to invite you here to hear you speak about this book, which has deeply influenced my own work. And <laughs> I really hope um, it inspires a lot of other people in Iranian studies and Middle East studies to to engage with STS. Um, so thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.